Hello comrades and welcome to another video on the Chinese Revolution area of study two. Uh, this video will cover the years of 1961 to 1965 uh, in which Mao took a bit of a back seat in terms of politics and economic recovery following the Great Leap Forward. Um, here's a quote from Liu Xiaoqi, which really highlights the difference between him and Mao when it comes to, um, to the economy. Uh, he said, the period of revolutionary storm and stress is past. Let's get down to practical work. So as you can see, Liu Xiaoqi is far more of an economic pragmatist uh, compared to Mao, who's far more uh, off the cuff in his um, uh, economic plans. So let's start by looking at um, President Liu Xiaoqi, who is a key knowledge point in the study design. So it's important that we understand um, a bit about him. Uh, Liu Xiaoqi uh, had been in the CCP since its inception. As I wrote here, he was a CCP OG. Um, in 1921, the Comintern offered him a scholarship to study in Moscow, and he joined the Moscow branch of the CCP. Uh, he returned to China a year later, and in 1927, he gained a place on the CCP Central Committee. So uh, this is around the time of the Northern Expedition. Um, and so from, you know, within the first six years of the CCP, um, he was a key figure in the party. Uh, Liu was a military commissar during the Long March and Civil War and was a close ally of Mao at the Yan'an Soviet. Um, after 1949, uh, Liu was vice chairman of the CCP and was ranked second in the Politburo after Mao. Um, so he was incredibly significant in the party and in the um, in the PRC uh, and um, yeah, was sort of set up to be Mao's successor. Uh, one of his books, How to Be a Good Communist, was required reading for all CCP cadres. Uh, Liu favored Soviet-style approaches to economic planning. So um, compared to Mao, who um, really supported uh, the masses um, being involved in um, the economy and, and wanted a decentralized um, economic plan, uh, Liu favored um, a, a more central administration uh, overseeing economic planning. <clears throat> um, he became president of the PRC in 1959 after the Wuhan plenum during the Great Leap Forward uh, and was designated Mao's successor in 1961. Uh, Liu fell out of favor with Mao during the recovery from the Great Leap Forward as he um, was he wound back many of the practices of the Great Leap Forward and really denounced uh, many of those practices. So uh, that really came to a head in at the 7,000 Cadres Conference. Um, so in January 1962, a Central Committee Conference was held to review the policies of the Great Leap Forward. Uh, under Liu Xiaoqi's guidance, the Central Committee endorsed the three privates and one guarantee. So the one guarantee was... Um, basically that it was essential to meet government production quotas. Um, so peasants must meet the grain production quotas of the government, uh, just like the proletariat must meet indu industrial uh, production quotas. Um, however, the three privates uh, meant that peasants could farm their small plots of land and um, uh, quite a lot of uh, previously communal land was given over to the peasants for individual family farming. Um, they could produce handicrafts and they could sell their products at market. So trying to reintroduce some uh, capitalist systems um, in a similar way to how the NEP uh, in Russia tried to reintroduce some capitalist systems to ease um, pressure. Uh, cadres discussed at the 7000 Cadres conference who or what was responsible for the famine. And it was uh, decided that it was 30% natural calamities and 70% human failings. You can attribute that quote to Liu Xiaoqi. Uh, Liu Xiaoqi denounced the Great Leap Forward and Maoist methods. He said, not only has there been no Great Leap Forward, there has been a great deal of falling backwards. Um, so really denouncing um, uh, Mao's uh, plan with the Great Leap Forward. Uh, Mao, to his credit, offered a, offered a self-criticism. He said, any mistakes that the center has made ought to be my direct responsibility. And I also have an indirect share of the blame because I am chairman of the central committee. There are some other comrades who also bear responsibility, but the person primarily responsible should be me. 
So that last sentence uh, is quite telling because while Mao did offer the self-criticism and took some of the blame for the Great Leap Forward, um, there were other comrades who should have borne, borne responsibility, but no one did take responsibility. Um, so many of the provincial cadres who um, misled the central uh, committee um, by feeding them um, false surplus statistics um, on grain production, uh, they should have taken some of the responsibility, but no one did. And so Mao was not happy. Uh, he withdrew from party leadership while remaining chairman of the CCP. Uh, and Liu Shaoqi assumed sort of de facto control of the party. So Liu Shaoqi, along with General Secretary Deng Xiaoping, and uh, as well as Chen Yun, uh, engineered China's post-Great Leap Forward economic uh, recovery. Crops were redirected to famine-affected regions, trying to um, ease some of the pressure of the famine. Uh, grain exports were halted. Now, this is the first time in China's history that um, uh, that grain exports, um, well, in, in its uh, in modern history, that grain exports had been halted because grain had been China's greatest export. Uh, and in fact, in 1961, grain started to be imported from Australia, Canada, and elsewhere. Uh, backyard steel furnaces were scrapped and resources were um, redirected into heavy industry. Uh, people's communes were greatly reduced in size. So this statistic is slightly misleading because it suggests that communes are going, the number of, uh, it su suggests that communes are uh, going up. Uh, because the number of communes almost tripled. But the reason for that is because they were um, reducing in size, uh, trying to scale back some of the agricultural collectivization that had taken place during the Great Leap Forward and sort of moving back towards um, the uh, sort of higher agricultural cooperatives that we saw in during the first five-year plan. Um, so the number of communes uh, increased from around 24,000 in 1959 to 74,000 in 1963. Mm -hmm. um, up to 12% of collectivized land was given over to peasant families to um, carry out their own individual uh, farming to sustain themselves, uh, and peasant marketplaces were reintroduced. Um, now, to boost agricultural labor even further, as well as ease the overcrowding that had been happening in the cities due to the um, intense uh, investment in heavy industry, uh, the government encouraged urban dwellers to move to the countryside. So between 25 and 30 million people relocated from the cities to the country uh, in the early 1960s. Domestic grain production increased from 193 million tons in 1961 to 240 million tons by 1965. So um, there was, um, Liu Xiaoqi's economic reforms did have um, some uh, positive uh, results um, following the uh, famine of 1959 to 1961. So we've looked briefly at Liu Xiaoqi's economic reforms uh, and sort of what he did while um, he was president um, uh, of the CCP uh, and and had taken more of a central more of a um, central control of of the party. Um, that was a really bad sentence. Apologies, um, but let's have a look now at what uh, Mao was doing. Um, so while Mao Zedong was sidelined from power, he still retained control of um, ideology and propaganda. In September 1962, uh, the 10th Party Plenum addressed concerns about corruption within the communist bureaucracy, as well as how to infuse Maoist revolutionary values into the economic recovery program. Mao questioned the revolutionary vitality of the party rank and file um, and called for a campaign against revisionist and capitalist tendencies emerging in the PRC. Um, the 10th Plenum endorsed a new campaign called the Socialist Education Movement. Now, when we look at corruption within the communist bureaucracy, corruption had, uh, you know, the, the, the party had tried to stamp out corruption with some of the early um, mass campaigns, um, <clears throat> but uh, corruption persisted, uh, particularly during the Great Leap Forward when 
corrupt provincial cadres would um, take extra grain for, for themselves, distribute work points unevenly, um, things like that. So so Mao was really uh, wanting to put an end to uh, corruption within the communist bureaucracy, uh, pr particularly uh, among the uh, provincial cadres. So the socialist education movement was a series of campaigns in the early to mid 1960s aimed at stamping out corruption among communist officials and encouraging socialist values in wider society. It goes hand in hand with uh, Lim Biao's um, emulation campaigns, um, which we'll look at shortly, uh, which also tried to encourage um, socialist and particularly Mao Zedong thought values in wider society. So the focus of the socialist education movement was on improving the administration of the four cleanups. Now, in your textbook, you will see that the four cleanups are collection of communal grain, distribution of work points, accounting procedures, and care of public property. So trying to deal with corruption in those four areas. Um, but you can also think of the four cleanups as needing to clean things up in the political, economic, organizational, and ideological fields. The socialist education movement is widely regarded as the precursor of the cultural revolution, which will be, um, which we'll start looking at in our next video. Um, and also, I should note the socialist education movement is a key knowledge point in the study design. So um, it's important to uh, make a note of it. So let's continue looking at the socialist education movement. In February 1963, uh, at a CCP leadership conference, um, members of the CCP uh, leadership aimed to define the instructions um, for carrying out the socialist education movement. Uh, the conference passed a resolution drafted by, by Mao known as the Early Ten Points. Uh, associations of poor peasants would be mobilized to oversee work on the four cleanups so as to expose and pass judgment on corrupt cadres. Now, you can really see here that um, uh, Mao, sort of Mao, Mao's ideology when it comes to decentralization and putting power in the hands of the masses and particularly in the hands of the peasants, um, which you'll see uh, uh, um, how his ideology around this differs from that of Deng Xiaoping and Zhu Xiaoqi quite shortly. So throughout April 1963, an investigation of 150,000 CCP cadres in Henan province revealed that over 100,000 cases of speculation and profiteering, i.e. taking more than um, they deserved or take, taking more than they were um, allocated in terms of grain and work points. Um, over over 1,300 counter-revolutionary group activities, over 26,000 instances of landlords and rich peasants opposing the government, over 8,000 secret societies and religious groups, and over 50,000 instances of marriages involving financial transactions. So um, not only did uh, this investigation uncover um, high levels of corruption among CCP cadres, but it also... Um, uh, found instances of society sort of going backwards in terms of reverting to um, traditional views of marriage and going against the 1950 marriage law. So in se September 1963, Deng Xiaoping updated the directives, introducing the later 10 points in which party-directed work teams of reliable officials would travel to regions suspected of corrupt practices and mentor regional administration towards improvement so as to minimally disrupt agricultural work. So this was a much lighter response, not uh, putting the hands in, putting the power in the hands of poor peasants to carry out um, speak bitterness meetings and um, to uncover uh, corruption among the cadres, but instead to send out reliable officials to mentor corrupt cadres to uh, improve. Unsurprisingly, corruption continued um, after Deng Xiaoping's um, updated directives. <clears throat> now, a year later, in September 1964, um, after Lu Xiaoqi's wife uh, traveled to the countryside to find immense levels of corruption, uh, Lu Xiaoqi drafted a third series of instructions called the Revised Later Ten Points. 
This gave work teams, so still work teams of trusted um, party officials, um, authorization to investigate peasants' complaints of corruption and take over if they found corrupt activity by local cadres. <clears throat> this led to a sweeping purge of regional party cadres, with five million cadres being punished, uh, and the purge threatened to affect day-to-day -day farm work. Um, work teams often acted dictatorially, and took over many of the responsibilities that Mao had assigned to peasant associations. Uh, so that caused a rift between Mao and Lu. Um, so although Lu Xiaoqi's approach helped to weed out corruption, it failed to address broader capitalist tendencies in the countryside um, and really showed the difference between Mao and Lu. Mao wanted to unleash a mass campaign uh, led by peasants um, against revisionist and capitalist attitudes, while Lu saw the struggle as an internal party matter, placing his trust in party-directed work teams. <clears throat> Mao, um, as a result, grew increasingly convinced that Lu Xiaoqi was following the capitalist road. Um, he is quoted as saying, there are at least two factions in our party. One is the socialist faction, the other is the capitalist faction. So um, the socialist education movement did uncover and um, uh, d d to a large extent deal with um, practices of corruption within um, the party. Uh, however, it um, didn't necessarily um, improve uh, socialist values in, in broader society. And that's where Lim Biao comes in. So Lim Biao joined the CCP in 1925 and enrolled in the Huangpu Military Academy in 1926. Um, he was part of the Nationalist Revolutionary Army um, that uh, during the Northern Expedition, um, but was very much a, a communist, not a member of the Nationalist. Remember that the NRA, <clears throat> the Nationalist Revolutionary Army, um, was part of the First United Front um, against uh, the warlords. Uh, Lim Biao was one of the most important military commanders during the Jiangxi Soviet era. Uh, historian Edgar Snow is uh, quoted as saying, Lin's force became the most dreaded section of the Red Army. Uh, Lin was co a committed supporter of Mao and was a veteran of the Long March. Um, he was a staunch Maoist, and in 1959, he became defense minister of the, um, uh, of the government. Uh, at the 7,000 Cadres Conference, uh, Lim Biao showed his devotion to Mao. He said, the thoughts of the chairman are always correct. If we encounter any problem, any difficulty, it is because we have not followed the instructions of the chairman closely enough. So that shows you where Lim Biao's loyalties lie. Uh, during the socialist education movement, Lin compiled Mao's quotes into the Little Red Book and sponsored major emulation campaigns, which we'll see both of those in the later slides. Uh, Lin rose to prominence during the Cultural Revolution and was one of the key figures behind the growth of Mao's cult of personality. Uh, at the Ninth Party Congress, he became vice chairman uh, of the party. Um, now, I should note that uh, after um, after 1970, Lin fell out of favor with Mao. Um, I'm just going to read from the textbook here. As Mao began to doubt the power that had been given to military officials, he lost further influence when Premier Zhou and Mao pushed forward with plans to end China's diplomatic isolation from the West. Lin was opposed to talks with the USA, but his con concerns were ignored. He suffered from several physical and psychological ailments that became worse as he grew older, and he was increasingly ill after 1970. Lin died in mysterious circumstances in 1971, allegedly while fleeing to the Soviet Union following an ill-fated coup uh, initiated by his son Tiger Lin Liguo. Um, so Lin, while I just talked about his downfall in the um, CCP, um, at the time that we're looking at 1961 to 1965, he was really Mao's closest ally. So that brings us on to the Little Red Book. Um, several campaigns um, centered around the military were carried out um, at the same time as the socialist education movement. And they can kind of be seen as synonymous um, because the socialist, one aspect of the socialist education movement was on spreading um, 
uh, socialist values throughout society. Uh, and the Little Red and many of these campaigns led by Lim Biao uh, aim to do just that. Uh, Lim Biao was the driving force behind efforts to strengthen Mao Zedong thought within the People's Liberation Army, as well as to grow Mao's cult of personality. And he compiled a book of Mao's famous writings titled Quotations of Chairman Mao Zedong, uh, but this is popularly known as the Little Red Book. So this was first published in May 1964. Uh, it was issued to every soldier um, since uh, Lim Biao was the defense minister. Um, and served as the basis for intense daily study. So while soldiers um, uh, carried out military training, they also um, uh, carried out um, ideological training uh, in terms of studying the Little Red Book daily. Um, later, the Little Red Book was widely distributed and became the chief text used in schools. Now, I realize I've written this twice. So that's in September 1966 that it was widely distributed. Um, a billion copies were distributed by the end of 1966, so that's after the um, Cultural Revolution had begun. Um, during the course of the Cultural Revolution, so from 1966 to 1976, more than 40 billion copies of the Little Red Book were printed. That was enough to provide each Chinese man, woman, and child with 15 copies each. So it really, the Little Red Book was, it was um, a, a really powerful tool for spreading Mao Zedong thought. Uh, throughout society, starting with the soldiers, um, which is uh, quite significant considering um, uh, by giving the little red book to every soldier initially, that is growing um, Mao's cult of personality within the army, um, and then later spreading throughout society. So let's have a look at some emulation campaigns. So in the 1960s, the CCP introduced a series of learn from propaganda campaigns, um, encouraging the Chinese people to embrace socialist values by emulating other individuals who demonstrated these values. So let's look at uh, two of these emulation campaigns, although there are quite a few that you can um, look into. Um, but let's just look at these two. So the first is learn from the PLA. So the People's Liberation Army was reformed and politicized under Lim Biao, partly due to the um, spreading of Mao's Little Red Book. Um, but also commissars were appointed to all levels of the military to oversee political study. Uh, army uniforms no longer showed rank, so trying to, um, trying to make it more of an egalitarian um, system and, and more in line with communism. Um, the People's Liberation Army also took on a greater role in popular political education, um, partly due to their um, studying of the Little Red Book and then spreading this to um, throughout society, but also sponsoring arts festivals, performances and literature. Uh, on the 1st of February 1964, an editorial in the People's Daily announced Mao's directive to learn from the PLA i.e. telling people in society, look at these great communists in our, in our People's Liberation Army, learn from them and be like them. Uh, the second emulation campaign we'll look at is the Learn From Lei Feng campaign. So in August 1962, Lei Feng, a 21-year-old PLA soldier, was killed by a toppling telegraph pole while working in Liaoning province. Um, now, that sounds fairly unremarkable. Um, it, he was only 21. He, he didn't die in battle or anything like that. Um, and yet he died in August 1962. However, what, when, um, what becomes significant about Lei Feng is that in 1963, uh, his diary was uncovered and published and um, spread throughout uh, Chinese society. And Mao announced the Learn from Lei Feng program. Lei Feng's diary described his role as a volunteer, a diligent worker, and a staunch follower of Mao Zedong thought. Um, I'll read an extract from Lei Feng's diary, which comes from your textbook on page 214. He said, To me, Chairman Mao's works are like food, weapons, and the steering wheel of a vehicle. To live, you must have food. To fight, you must have a weapon. To drive a vehicle, you must have a steering wheel. And to work for revolution, you must read Chairman Mao's works. 
So you can see why Mao was so taken by uh, Lei Feng. Um, another quote from um, Lei Feng's diary, um, he uh, said that his greatest goal in life was to be, quote, a revolutionary screw that never rusts. Um, so he was a, a staunch Maoist, a staunch communist, uh, and he became a martyr and symbol of the new China. Um, now, Interestingly, it has since been uncovered that Lei Feng's diary was largely a work of fiction produced by the propaganda, propaganda arm of the PLA, or at least there's evidence to suggest that that's the case. Um, so while it may, so while Lei Feng was a real person, um, his diary may have been largely fictitious. Uh, however, it still was incredibly um, powerful in terms of uh, spreading Mao Zedong thought throughout the countryside and throughout the country. So let's summarize. Um, now, that I should note there's there's lots that we haven't discussed in this video um, about the, the same period. Um, I'll try and touch on some of them in our next video, introducing the Cultural Revolution, um, but we'll also explore some of them in class. So from so to summarize, from 1961, President Liu Xiaoqi introduced a range of policies uh, to address the famine crisis, including reducing the size of the people's communes, allowing peasants to farm their own family plots, and importing grain from um, other countries. Uh, in 1962, the 7,000 Cadres Conference endorsed these approaches, um, as well as pointing out that the famine was 30% um, natural calamities and 70% um, human failings. Uh, Mao was concerned with corruption among provincial Cadres and a perceived degeneration of socialist values in Chinese society, and this led to the socialist education movement. The socialist education movement helped to expose corruption, uh, but also exposed ideological differences within the party. Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and Liu Xiaoqi each put forward different 10 points directives, which reflected the different approaches and agendas within the party leadership. Uh, Lin Biao, at the same time as the socialist education movement was taking place, directed the indoctrination of Mao Zedong thought throughout the People's Liberation Army, uh, the study and memorization of the Little Red Book was introduced alongside regular military training. Um, and Mao celebrated the PLA as virtuous uh, socialist heroes that ordinary Chinese people should emulate uh, through the Learn from the PLA campaign. Soldiers such as Lei Feng were presented as examples to follow through the Learn from Lei Feng campaign. Um, the Learn from the PLA campaign also increased the role of the military in popular education. So that sort of sets the stage for the biggest event in um, in modern twentieth century Chinese history, which uh, is the Cultural Revolution, which we will start exploring in our next video. I hope you found this video useful and interesting, and I will see you next time.